How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. So we did your bio. We introduced you. You're ready for the interview? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's do it. So uh, I did some digging and turns out your father was a warden. Is that correct? <laughs> I don't like to talk about it. Okay, but you do like talking about your father, I believe. He was he coached you baseball too, and I know he's very influential. What was that relationship like? Sort of having this incredible um, figure in your life to like sort of uh, pave the way for for baseball for you. Yeah, he um, he was a major in college at University of Arizona. He, his major was uh, criminal justice, and his minor was psychology. So he had a really good idea of you know how the brain worked honestly and his his love of sports translated um to me you know and and the way that he talked to me through through my life and the confidence that he instilled in me um since i was a young boy was was huge you know it was, it was uh every weekend almost every day when i was out of school bit you know if it was a winter break or if it was in the summer when there was no school going on it was pretty much baseball every day. He loved it. I loved it. And that was basically how our relationship was, was it was, it was based around sports, whether it was on TV or, you know, at the local ballpark. Um, he was, he was constantly helping and there, and it was something that I loved. So he never really had to push me in, in it. Um, but he was just constantly there and, and hitting ground balls, throwing batting practice, whatever it was. So you got drafted twice by the Diamondbacks. Clearly they were interested. You never played for them, but you, you were drafted twice. Why, when it's, especially when a team shows you this twice, right? That they, they go ahead. Uh, I have a friend who played in, in, the, in hockey and in the NHL and he was drafted by two different teams. So he didn't really have, but here's a team that really stretched to get you twice. Um, why turn down the pros one or two times to, to stay in college? Well, the first time I was drafted out of high school and that was the year 2000. And at that point in time, there was a thing called the draft and follow. So a team could draft, draft you and they could automatically put um, D and F it's called draft and follow. Um, so that they, they keep your rights for the full year. And then before the next draft, there's a negotiation for a contract. So depending on how you grow, you know, how much stronger you get, what your freshman year of college looks like. They now have negotiating rights before the draft. Um, so they drafted me, put the DNF snap stamp on me. I went to junior college um, and we negotiated before that draft. And honestly, you know, my parents pushed school and they wanted me to be educated. They wanted me to go to college. So that was weighing heavy on me at the time. And I didn't feel like I was ready. You know, I was probably 170 pounds at the time, six foot, like, I always had confidence in myself, but I was just unsure about that next step. Like I felt like college was important, um, you know, educationally and just baseball development wise. I wanted that experience. Um, so the, the, the negotiation was pretty much one sided. Like we weren't going to commit to anything unless they blew us away. Um, and so that, that passed, the draft came about and then they drafted me again and they, they improved. I think it was like three rounds or something or four rounds. So there was really no negotiation there. Um, and you can only, you can only DNF one time on a certain player. So they drafted me again, the negotiations continued and it didn't get anywhere. And then I ended up going back to school and back into the draft and then ended up getting picked by the Rangers. Right. So 17th round and we saw something really, I mean, COVID of all the industries that it impacted, certainly in, in sports or entertainment. I mean, Hollywood uh, too, but, but baseballs w will completely be a different game when we get back. I mean, the, the, the minor leagues have been ripped apart. The draft is significantly smaller. Um, the, the teams that now, like, you, you, you mean, I'm just talking about the White Sox and Twins have made so much progress in, in that short season that it's going to look, you know, baseball's going to look really different when we get back to it, I think. So coming out of 17th round, what, what was that experience like? You'd already been drafted. Were you still excited? Were you ready to play for the Rangers? Did you want to get, you know, what was it like being drafted then? And how do you reflect on it now where, you know, you weren't a top pick, so you still had to earn, certainly earn your spot moving forward. You weren't just going to be handed the spot. Does that, how does that play into your mindset going into the seasons? Well, being 
being drafted, first of all, was a great experience and something that I never really uh, anticipated at the point. And, you know, coming out of high school and junior college, I never really anticipated it. And then being drafted out of, out of Missouri in the 17th round, to be honest with you, I was a little disappointed. I always had a chip on my shoulder. Like I said, my dad always pumped me full of confidence. And I had a lot of confidence in myself and my ability. I always thought that I was, this might sound a little cocky, but I always felt like I was better than everybody else on my team. And in high school, I had four, I had four big leaders um, besides myself, four guys that made it to the major leagues besides myself. So I was playing in a hotbed at the time in Tucson, Arizona, you know, full of, of prospects. Um, a couple other guys in the city actually made it to the big leagues also at that that particular time. And I felt like I was the best player um, on the inside. And when I got drafted in the 17th round, that just made the chip on my shoulder bigger. So um, when I got drafted, you asked how I felt. I was out to prove people wrong right away. And I think, you know, the first five rounds, it was like, all right, I, I should probably be, be selected in the first five to 10 rounds. And it, at the time it was all computerized. So or it wasn't computerized. Everything was, you know, digital. And it was like this, you had to listen to the radio and find out where you're getting drafted. You had to listen to the radio and blah, blah, blah. So um, I was at Missouri and I talked a friend, a teammate into mine who was driving back to California. He was going to give me a ride back to Tucson uh, and drop me off in Tucson as he's going to California to stay an extra day because I wanted to listen to the first 10 rounds of the draft because I thought I was going to get picked. Um, so he, he agreed. We stayed for the first day. I didn't get picked. And then he wanted like, let's go, let's get, I need to get back home. So the drive across the country, you're going through mountain ranges, the cell service isn't as good in 2003. So I'm, I have no cell cell service. I don't know when I got drafted. Uh, when we're coming out of the mountains, Flagstaff, Arizona, down into the Valley into Phoenix, I, my phone, I have a bunch of messages and I find out I'm picking the 17th round. And at that time I was, it was, it was a weird feeling. Like I was excited for the next step. I was excited to learn that level of baseball and to, to be taught what those coaches had to offer me. Um, but I was also a little, a little, uh, a little pissed off, honestly. Like I felt that I should have been picked higher. I felt like I was a better player. So I had that chip on my shoulder and I was extremely motivated going into that first year. And you, 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 you didn't spend that much time in the minor leagues, a little bit of time, but, uh, but expect, and I, and I mean that in the sense that you also switched positions, um, pretty early on, you went from shortstop to second base. Uh, what's the hardest thing, um, to switch from, especially like the shortstop seen as the captain often of, of certainly of the infield, uh, you know, and maybe of the whole team moving to second base. Um, I don't re recall, maybe you do, but who your shortstop was that was ahead of you. Was it Omar? Could, was it Omar Vizquel? I mean, that would be a reason to move the second, I guess. He, he was <laughs> one of the best fielders of all time in his position. So who is, you know, moving to second? Why did that happen? And how did that, how are you comfortable with that? It's a good question. Uh, first, Omar Vizquel and I were actually teammates in Texas. He played shortstop and I played second um for a period in time in texas but going back to the question i played shortstop up until triple a in my my whole entire life i never played another position um so i had to i had to adapt and i had to learn that position and at the time alex rodriguez was the shortstop when i got drafted and michael young was the second baseman um as i was moving through the ranks they traded alex rodriguez and they, they traded him for Alfonso Soriano. So Soriano became the second baseman. Michael Young became the shortstop. Um, so my first sprint, my first big league spring training, Alfonso Soriano was the second baseman. I knew right away I wasn't going to make the team. But the transition to second base was a little bit of a difficult one. You know, I had to, I had to, really the, the, the difficult, the most difficult part for me was the double play. Because as a shortstop, if you think about it, you're you're receiving the ball only from the second baseman or the first baseman, right? So everything is in front of you with your 
guys, you can see the runner coming. You can see, you know, how much time you have. You can see the runner from home going first. So, you know, your clock is just peripheral. You, you have a better idea. Second base, you're blind. So you don't know how close that runner is and you don't know how much time you have. It's all a guess. Um, and for me at the time, there was no slide rule. So you can get wiped out pretty, pretty easily. And so that was always questionable for me. I, I didn't know like how quick I had to be. I really didn't know where first base was because it was just different angles. Um, so it took me a year. It took me a year to, to, to adapt to that. And, you can practice as much as you want and, you know, but once you get into the game, you have someone, you have someone 220 pounds bearing down on you and you hear some gold chains flapping in the wind, getting close to you. You gotta, you gotta turn that double play. But um, yeah, at the, at the time it was sorry. I don't know Michael Young. And then they, they ended up trading. Is he frozen? Um, they ended up trading sorry on to the Washington nationals. And that gave me a, basically a clear shot to, to second base. It's amazing to think about how many, not just good players, but really, really good players, in some cases, multiple potential Hall of Famers, they had up the middle between shortstop and second baseman for almost 20 years. I, don't even, I didn't even think about it. And you, and you add in like having Adrian Beltre also at third base. For, I mean, they really had those. I mean, they haven't been the greatest team but they've had those positions on lockdown for quite a while. It seems like, um, which is amazing. Um, I want to talk about some of your achievements. Um, we mentioned it before you got on 1,999 hits. You're the Barry Sanders of, of <laughs> Major League baseball, right? You're, I don't know that you're afraid of that record, but uh, I'm sure that the number would have liked to be rounded, but four time all-star twice the 30, 30 club. Um, but of all these achievements, you pitched an inning and hit a home run in the same inning, which I imagine never crossed your mind ever <laughs> until that happened. What was it like being this four-time All-Star and being called onto the mound to get out of the inning and then homer as a pitch? I think you, you homered as a pitcher. So what was that experience like? So that was actually my last game. That was actually oh. my last Major League Baseball game. Is that your last at bat? That was my last at bat. Um, it was, it was crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. And I never, I never pitched before. I mean, I, last time I pitched, I was 13 years old, you know? So at the beginning of the season, our manager, his name was Andy Green. And he two or three times leading up to that said, would you ever be interested in pitching? Is this a bucket list thing? you want to, you know, is this something that would be fun for you? And I said, honestly, no, I don't want to, I don't want to pitch, like find somebody else. I don't really have that good of an arm. I mean, I'm a second baseman. I'm, I'm going to go out there and throw 75 or whatever. But um, at the point, at this point, I had been rolled into a bench player and my time on the field was limited. So at that time I was like, I got to help the team out somehow that they needed an inning of, of relief, I can do that. So I go out there and pitch and get through the inning. It was a mess of an inning. I didn't give up any runs, so my ERA is 0.00, .00 or whatever. Um, I hit a guy in the hand. Like, it was just – it was a mess. I, I tried to throw one as hard as I could, and I threw it 82. I, I felt like – I felt like it was 91 or something, and I turned around looking at the scoreboard and it said 82. So that was a little humbling. But um, when I got through that inning, I was hitting second in the inning and ended up hitting a home run. So it was crazy. I mean, the crowd was – it was a blowout game. The crowd was chanting my name and doing all kinds of crazy things. I hadn't been on the field in a month. You know, it was like – it was it was pretty crazy. It was a really, really nice, nice last at bat. And in regards to the – number of hits that I got in my career, you know, 1,999, like a lot of people have mentioned that. And to me, if it was, if I was going for 3000, that's a different story. You know, that's a shoe in hall of famer. Uh, 
the longevity of a, of, of a career for a 3000 hit player is just ridiculous. So you have to tough it out and get that one more hit. And there's always an organization that wants to see you do that. Um, <clears throat> but for me, 2000, yeah, it's a great milestone. And um, would I like to have 2000 hits? Absolutely. But I gave everything that I had for my 14 years of play and I got 1,999 hits. That's what I got. And you know, that I have no shame in that, or I don't, you know, I, I don't regret not trying to play a little bit longer to get one more hit. I, I don't see the point in it. It's it, I ended where I ended. I mean, I had 250 something home runs, you know, what's, what's 254 to 260. I don't, I don't know. Um, it's not, it's not a big deal to me. For me, it was, it was all about the wins. I mean, I just wanted to be part of wins. I really honestly did not care about statistical measures. I really like personal statistical measures. Um, I just didn't, you know, I, I, it was, it was pointless to me. I didn't, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it. Now 3000 hits, I can wrap my head around that or 500 home runs. You can wrap your head around that. Those are, those are proving longevity. And that's a different type of number. Um, but you know, playing 162 games in a year or, you know, at one point in Detroit, I had the opportunity to lead the league in at bats. So the most played appearances in, in the league and we were, we were out of eliminated um, out of the postseason play with a week and a half left. And Brad Osmus, um, he was my manager at the time, came up to me and he said, Hey, you, if you get four at bats for the next week and a half, you can lead the league in plate appearances. Is this something that you, you know, that you're interested in? And I said, absolutely. I don't, that's, I don't really, that's not something that I, you know, hang my hat on. Um, and that's similar to the way I felt about, you know, ending with 1,999 hits. It's just, I think it's kind of cool to be able to say it. <laughs> yeah. It's, that's a great answer. I, I love it. And, uh, I mean, you certainly in a couple of years will be on the ballot. I mean, there's no doubt you, you, you've accomplished way more than than most uh, MLB players. Uh, and um, and we're excited to, if I ever get a vote, uh, which I won't, but if I did, I would totally vote for you. Um, <laughs> so uh, you've been known as a great teammate, but I want to know who's the team that you felt you most gelled with? Is there a group of guys that you just felt really sort of inseparable with? Um, and you played some for some great teams. You won a won a World Series. So what, what are you know maybe share with us sort of what 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 that team was and how that camaraderie built. It was definitely it was definitely 2010 2011 Texas Rangers. Um, and the, the before that point, the Texas Rangers had never won a postseason series. So they've been to the postseason, but they never, they've never won a series. And in 2010, we beat the Tampa Bay Rays for the first, you know, series win for the organization. And those two years, the guys that I played with, it's, it's a brother. I mean, you hear it a lot, but if you do have an actual brother, um, which I don't, <laughs> but I could imagine it's, you know, you pick up where you left off. Like, you can move away from each other. You can be just, you know, a long ways away. Your lives can go, you know, separate ways. But when you see each other face to face, it's, you know, you pick up where you left off. And that's those two years and those teammates that I had in that, that period of time is, is how I feel about those guys. Um, and we, and, you know, winning breeds that, you know, I don't, I don't really remember too many guys in my Detroit Tigers team where we lost 99 games. I remember, two guys, you know, Shane Green and Justin Upton are two, two guys that I'll talk to forever that were on that team. Everyone else, I don't, I'm not too fond of just because there's a lot of losing going on. <laughs> and I, and I see the St. Louis hat. <laughs> yeah. 2011. That was a, that was a heart. That was a heart dagger there. Yeah. If you but, think that's a good, if you think that's a good hat, I, I got the hat for you. There right. You go. So well, well, well I, I knew I'd put it on at some point. So um, I want to talk post playing day. So you, you've uh, <laughs> you have um, obviously retired from game baseball. We'll, we'll get into Israel at the, at the end. So so uh, I saw an interview once that said, okay, so 
you could do anything and someone's going to say yes. And you said, I want to partner with Bill Gates. I don't know if you remember that interview that you would you would partner with Bill Gates and you would learn from him. And okay, so but now your playing days are over. What are you planning on doing? We'll, we'll talk about Team Israel in a moment. But what what's the plan for Ian Kinsler uh, post uh, baseball playing days? Uh, well, right now I'm working in the front office for the San Diego Padres. I'm a special assistant, they call it. It's kind of a broad name, but that's what they call it. Um, a special assistant to AJ Preller, who's the general manager for Padres. So right now I'm sitting on these types of calls with, you know, the inner circle of the Padres determining free agency options, uh, trades, you know, minor league players, how, what we're going to do with our minor leagues. You mentioned the minor leagues is going to look different this year. So these, these are all discussions that are going on right now. So that's basically what I'm doing as a job, I guess. Um, I also am a, a co-owner of a bat company called Warstick um, with a guy named Ben Jenkins, who started the company, and then Jack White, who is a musician, a musician and myself. It's us three. Um, and right now we're close to finishing a, a, like a brick and mortar headquarters in downtown Dallas. So that's kind of right now is in the process of that. So we're figuring out, you know, Right now, I went down. I went or this this morning. I went down there and checked out. We have a huge batting cage. We're trying to figure out the nets and you know, contracting that out and trying to figure that out. So that's that's basically what I'm doing and a lot of family time. So golf, doing a little San San Diego Padres front office thing, and then trying to help out this war war sick thing as as much as I can. And then um, come New Year's, I got to start getting back in shape. Cause I got to get ready for the Olympics. <laughs> That's amazing. So it's super exciting. The, um, I want to, you know, the Padres, so the white, so I'm a huge white Sox fan and everyone knows that I <laughs> bleed white Sox. Uh, they <laughs> are my love and joy. Um, and you know, so many people say like the, the trade for Fernando Tatis, which obviously worked out well for the Padres, James Shields for, I think you'd do that a hundred times over. But I also talk about like it also worked out for the White Sox because they would have had this log jam of arguably the two best shortstops in baseball. I mean, you can make Tatis and Anderson are certainly up there, if not the two best. What would they have done? And then people are like, well, they move Anderson to second. I was like, Nick Madrigal is arguably going to be the best second baseman in baseball in two years. So it worked out. So enjoy him um, as much as it, it pains me to see him doing what he's doing. I know that I don't know what they would have done, where, where they would have put him. So let's talk about Team Israel. So um, for those of you who don't know the story, Ian went and made Aliyah to Israel the day before COVID broke, and they flew him right back. It was probably the quickest visit to Israel in the history of its country. Um, and he's going to be representing Israel this year in the Olympics. I'm hoping they bring home uh, a medal, likely, I mean, a really solid chance at, at gold. Um, Ian, what, what was behind the decision to, to play for Team Israel, and how excited are you about this? Well, I just made a decision to retire, and uh, Peter Kurtz called me, who's the general manager of, you know, the team, um, and ran me through a quick, you know, overview of what happened in the European qualifier and how Team Israel qualified for the Olympics, and he asked me if I'd be interested, and I, hands down, was like, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> as, a, as an athlete, as a ball player – playing baseball in the Olympics is always a dream. You know, it's, a, it's very rare that you get that opportunity. Baseball being in the Olympics is very rare and that it worked out, you know, the timing of it worked out where I retired and now I'm an amateurs, you know, my pro status is gone and I'm able to compete. Um, it was just crazy timing. And then you mentioned, you know, having to go to, to Israel, get my citizenship passport, make all the, uh, um, the timing of that was crazy too. Like you said, I mean, we got there, me and my wife were flying to Israel and we were in JFK as a layover to go to Israel. And we're on, you know, our phones looking at the news, trying to read what the prime minister is saying about the protocol of people coming into the country. And no one knows what he's going to say, but we're about to get onto a plane and fly to the country. So we get there Peter picks us up at the airport. Three hours later, the prime minister gets on television and says, 
that everyone that enters the country has to quarantine for 14 days. <laughs> we beat it by like three hours. Me and my wife beat it by like three hours. We spent the week there um, in Tel Aviv. We did Jerusalem. We did, we did every, everything that you could see in four days. We jammed as much as we could in, which was mind blowing. It was moving. It was exceptional. And we 100% want to go back. We're already talking about, so for the Olympics, we don't know if, if uh, my wife and my kids can go to Tokyo yet. Um, we don't know if, you know, Japan needs a vaccine for people to come in and out or whatever the case may be. So she's thinking of taking the kids and flying to Israel while I go to Tokyo. And then after the Olympics flying to Israel, and she's, she wants to rent an apartment for like a month and, and Tel Aviv and stay there. So that was, that was the whole trip. But my mindset on the Olympics was, um, honestly, just like what an opportunity it was to be put you know, at, at that time to have the opportunity to do it and to be asked to do it. Um, and right now I'm trying to get to know the guys as best as I can. They, they all have a tremendous relationship. They've, you know, been on, been around the world together playing baseball, been on these European championship teams and, and, uh, you know, been through emotional highs and lows. And I haven't, I haven't been there with them. So we, we do zoom calls probably once a, once a month as a team. Um, so I'm getting to know some of the guys. I know a couple of them um, besides everyone else. And, and I'm trying to fit in as best I can and, and trying to be a part of the, the family as best I can. I, if I, I know most of these guys I, uh, besides Josh and Ryan and those guys, are, you know, but there, if I know Danny Valencia and he and you're hitting in front of him and he gets a knock, you know, you'll feel right at home. That guy makes <laughs> everyone smile immediately. All right, last question. Ready? Favorite baseball movie of all time? I have to, that's that's impossible. <laughs> you're gonna pick a, my favorite one? Yeah, give it a shot. <sighs> Man. I mean, I got kids. I got a 12 year old and a nine year old. So Sandlot is <laughs> probably seen four times a year in my household. Um, and it was always one of my favorites. You know, I, I guess I guess I'll go with Sandlot. I mean, there's so many great ones. I, it's hard to pick, but uh, I'll go with Sandlot. All right. Wonderful. Ian, thank you so much. We're all going to be rooting for you. I mean, I certainly am. I wake up to watch those crazy early games. We're ecstatic and uh, love everything you did for the game of baseball. And uh, and we're excited to see what you do for the game of, uh, for Israel baseball. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Jeremy.